This is Gary Steber with a message from Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 19. God delivers his people either from the trials of life or through the trials of life. We'll see that distinction made with James and Peter. We'll see the last ministry action of Peter in the book of Acts and in Jerusalem generally. And we'll see when the trials of this life come, our faith in Jesus and the God who saves is really all we have. We'll see the power of prayer and belief. And the question we're left to ask ourselves is how much do we believe God is capable of doing what we pray for? Now, before we begin, I'd like to remind you, if you follow the Explore the Bible study schedule like we do, we give away our study materials free of charge. We publish every week, seven to ten days prior to the lesson's scheduled date. And if you'd like to get the complete study notes along with the presentation to use as your needs require, click on the link in the description below and give us the email address you'd like to have notified. Each week we'll send you the link to the church website where you can download the materials. Now before we begin, let's start by setting a little context, as we always do. After the activities in Antioch in chapter 11, chapter 12 is set back in Jerusalem. The persecution of the church continues, but in a different way. The attack in chapter 12 isn't from the religious leaders. This is the first political attack against the church by Herod. Now Herod is a family name, and several people are referred to as Herod in the Bible, so let's set a little context on this. Herod the Great was a king established by Rome to rule over most of the land of Israel. He was the Herod who ordered the killing of all the babies in and around Bethlehem to kill Jesus. Mary and Joseph, you recall, took Jesus to Egypt for safety and returned after he died. We're told that in Matthew 2, verses 16 through 21. Herod the Great was a great builder. He built a temple that was in Jerusalem during Jesus' lifetime and many other monumental projects. He was also a lunatic. He had at least eight wives and killed six of them for fear they would turn against him. He had at least 14 children and killed three of them for the same reason. When Herod the Great died, the rule over the land of Israel was split among at least three of his sons and overseen by a series of Roman governors, including Pontius Pilate. One of his sons, Herod Philip II, ruled the far northern part of Israel, north of the Sea of Galilee. And most of the references in the Gospels to Herod are to Herod Antipas, who ruled over Galilee. And Herod Antipas had an adulterous relationship with Herod Philip II, his wife Herodias. And John the Baptist criticized Antipas for that, which led to his death. Recall Herodias' daughter, she was a daughter from Philip, danced at Antipas' birthday. He was pleased and promised to give her anything she asked for. Prompted by Herodias, she asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter. That's in Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. He was the Herod Jesus referred to as a fox in Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 33. He was also the Herod who oversaw one of the trials of Jesus before his crucifixion. That's in Luke chapter 23, verses 6 through 12. Now Herod the Great had another son named Aristobulus, and he's one of the sons he had killed, but before he was dead, he had a son named Herod Agrippa I, who is the Herod in our passage today. Like his grandfather, Herod the Great, he reigned over most of the land of Israel. Agrippa had a daughter named Drusilla who would marry Felix, the Roman governor of Caesarea, who heard Paul's case in trial, but left him in prison for two years. That's in Acts chapter 23 and 24. Agrippa also had a son named Herod Agrippa II, and Agrippa II hears Paul's trial in Acts chapter 25 and 26. And he concluded that Paul has done nothing to deserve death and could have been released had he not appealed to Caesar. Now, as we said, our passage today focuses on Herod Agrippa I. And we'll see he killed James, the brother of John, and attempts to do the same to Peter. So this Herod Agrippa I is the grandson of Herod the Great. He was born in 10 or 11 B.C., he was king of Judea from the years 37 to 44 A.D. And Acts chapter 12 happens in the year 43 or 44. So we're now 8 to 10 years after the stoning of Stephen and the conversion of Saul. The book of Acts covers roughly 30 years from the years 30 to 60. And we're now in year 13 or 14. We're approximately 45% of the way through the timeline of the book of Acts. Stephen Gurr says, 
Historians paint Herod Agrippa I as an insecure, crowd-pleasing political figure. He was devoted to the Jewish lifestyle to appease the Jews for political purposes. He moved the capital back to Jerusalem. The Romans had moved it from Jerusalem to Caesarea sometime earlier, and politically this was a good move because the Jews loved that. But we know that being a people pleaser is often a sign of insecurity. And the Christians become easy targets for Agrippa to win political favor with the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders didn't like the Christians, and now probably even more so that they're accepting Gentiles into the faith. So we've seen the church first endured persecution from the religious leaders, and Saul in particular, in chapters 5 through 9. After Saul's conversion, the church had peace and was strengthened. We're told that in chapter 9, verse 31. It grew throughout the region as far away as Antioch, which is about 300 miles or 480 kilometers north of Jerusalem. And Stanley Toussaint says, The purpose of this section of Acts is to confirm Israel's rejection of the Messiah. Luke contrasts the love of the church of Antioch for the saints at Jerusalem at the end of chapter 11 with the cold-hearted enmity of Herod and the Jews for the church. Those are the words of Stanley Toussaint. As the door is opened in Antioch for the Gentiles, the door is closed in Jerusalem to the Jews. John Stott writes that in Acts chapter 12, we see the contrast between the destructive power of Herod and the saving power of God. And indeed, throughout church history, the pendulum has swung between expansion and opposition, growth and shrinkage, advance and retreat, although with the assurance that even the powers of death and hell will never prevail against Christ's church since it's built securely on the rock. Those are the words of John Stott. And with that as background, we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 12, starting at verse 1. About that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church, and he executed James, John's brother, with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter, too, during the festival of unleavened bread. The phrase about that time connects the events here with the famine relief that was sent from Antioch to Jerusalem through Barnabas and Saul in chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. The original language has an additional word meaning to mistreat or afflict evil. So his purpose is to inflict injury on the believers. And while this came from the political figurehead, it was certainly greatly influenced by the religious leaders. Now, execution by the sword most likely means James was beheaded. James was one of the inner circle of Jesus. On several occasions, Jesus would separate Peter, James, and John from the other disciples. He did that when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He did it at his transfiguration and when he prayed in the garden before his crucifixion. Stephen was the first martyr of the church, but James becomes the first of the 12 apostles to be murdered. And some believe he must have been recognized as one of the leaders in the Christian community and targeted for this reason. It's been said that Agrippa built theaters and held games to please the Romans and Gentiles and he slew the Christians to please the Jews. Now John, the brother of James, will be the last of the twelve apostles to die, and the only one who didn't die as a martyr. These two brothers form a bookend, so to speak, around the deaths of the other apostles. Now Jesus didn't promise any special protection for his believers. Quite the opposite, really. He said, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. And if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. That's in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 20. Now, by saying it pleased the Jews, Luke means the Jews that followed the religious leaders who hated the Christian believers. Herod was interested in pleasing people for political gain, and if killing James pleased the religious leaders, what could please them more than killing Peter, the leader of the Christians? Now, the wording of the phrase, to arrest Peter too, or also, causes some to suggest that he killed James and others were already in prison and then decided to arrest Peter also. Said another way, the plan was to kill more than just James and Peter. Now, we know the Festival of Unleavened Bread is the seven days following Passover, and Jewish tradition didn't allow executions during Passover. The phrase, during the festival, can be understood as the festival was near, which is confirmed in the next verse. Herod likely thought if killing Peter would please the Jewish leaders, 
doing it after Passover would please them even more. Recall a great number of people went to Jerusalem for Passover. This would make a great statement and spectacle. Verse 4. After the arrest, he put him in prison and assigned four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was praying fervently to God for him. It's ironic that Peter is arrested just before Passover. Recall the Jews celebrated their deliverance from bondage to an evil ruler in Egypt at Passover. Here Peter is delivered into bondage to the hands of an evil ruler in Jerusalem, the holy city. Peter is in a different type of prison in chapter 5 than he is in now. He was in a terasis in chapter 5. Now he's in a fuleke, and we might say he was in the local jail in chapter 5. Now he's in a Roman prison, possibly the Antonio Fortress, with much tighter security and more professional guards. These guards' lives depend on keeping this man locked up, and we could say he's now in the maximum security prison. Let me ask you a question. Why did Luke want us to know Peter was guarded by four squads each of four soldiers? Well, two reasons, perhaps. First, Peter and the apostles were arrested in chapter 5 by the captain of the temple guards and put into the public prison. An angel of the Lord let them out of prison that night and told them to proclaim the full message of the abundant and eternal life received in Jesus at the temple. When the guards went to retrieve them in the morning, they were gone. We're told that in chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. Agrippa had certainly heard this story and wanted to ensure it wouldn't happen again. So two of these four soldiers would be chained to Peter, and the other two will guard both Peter and the two who are chained to him. Hold on to that thought. And there's four squads, so they'll work in four different shifts. And the second thing, recall that the number four often represents a great work by God in the Bible. Anytime we see the number four mentioned, or something said or done four times, we should expect something great to happen. Here we have four sets of four. If this were a movie, this is the point where the music would change to something to help build anticipation. Now let me ask you a question. Why is it the intent to bring him out after the Passover? Well, two reasons, I think. First, Jewish tradition forbids the execution of capital punishment during Passover. And second, recall the custom of allowing the people to choose one prisoner to be released on Passover. The religious leaders coerced the crowd into calling for Barabbas to be released instead of Jesus. Agrippa is smart enough to leave no chance for the crowd to call for Peter to be released. Agrippa wasn't going to bring him out for any other reason than to kill him. Now recall one of the major activities preparing for Passover was to remove leaven or yeast from your house. It symbolizes removing sin from your life. While the people were doing this in their homes, Agrippa is planning murder for political gain in his heart. So let's capture the setting here. Peter is in prison under maximum security. We would call that bondage. We're in a season of Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. Both have been mentioned. Passover celebrates the Israelites being set free from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. It's a picture of redemption. The festival of unleavened bread speaks of purification. We mentioned the ridding of leaven or yeast earlier, which represents sin. Hold on to those two thoughts. Now, the word translated as fervently here is very intense, meaning to stretch out with great intensity and perseverance. Sometimes you see a movie where a character stretches with all their might to reach an object that will save their life, but it's just out of reach. That's the picture of this word. We might say that they're reaching out to God in prayer with the greatest diligence possible. Now, Peter was kept in prison. The word kept is in the imperfect tense, which means continual. He wasn't in prison overnight, but likely for several days. So this isn't a casual prayer to bless Peter with release from prison. Paul said to pray constantly or without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. And that's what we see here. And given Passover is at hand, it isn't hard to guess what the people were praying for. They know James was recently killed. They know the expected outcome for Peter. They are continually praying for Peter's release with the greatest urgency possible, and they prayed for days on end with no results so far. David said, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I plead my case to you and watch expectantly. 
That's in Psalms 5, verse 3. Hold on to that thought. Verse 6, When Herod was about to bring him out for trial, that very night, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. Striking Peter on the side, he woke him up and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off his wrists. Now this very likely is the first day after Passover and the Festival of Unleavened Bread. In the original language, there's an emphasis on the phrase, that very night, to draw our attention. He was about to bring him out for trial, but as we saw in the case of Jesus, sometimes these trials were in name only. They would often find a person guilty of what they already believed they were guilty of. Peter is to be killed in the morning. Now the question is, who knew that Peter was to be killed in the morning? Certainly Agrippa did. The guards probably knew. And if the guards knew, most probably Peter knew as well. If the guards knew, how likely is it they provoke Peter by telling him, this is your last day? Maybe they would say things like, I wonder which of us is going to kill you tomorrow. Now the two important things here are that God knew what would happen in the morning, and whether the guards knew or not, Peter was the only one sleeping. It's easy to get the picture that Peter and the two guards were all asleep, but that isn't the case. Peter's sleeping is described in the present tense. The guards watching are described in the imperfect tense, meaning continually, and in the active voice. The guards aren't sleeping, they're working. They're continually and actively watching while Peter is sleeping. Roman guards inherit the punishment due to the prisoner if they lose that prisoner. Whether scourging or death, that became their punishment. Now let me ask you a question. How could Peter possibly sleep chained to two guards the night before he is to be executed? Jesus told Peter, Truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. That's in John chapter 21 verses 18 and 19. And I think Peter takes Jesus' words to heart. He knows he's to live to be an old man, and he isn't there yet. And even if he were, he knows his death will glorify God. He had no idea what would happen, but he knew he was in God's hands, not Agrippa's. And sometime later, Peter would write, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. That's in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Peter could sleep because of the promise from Jesus. And we can sleep soundly because we have all the promises of God in the Bible. Peter demonstrates what Paul would later write, saying, I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard what he has entrusted to me until that day. That's in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Now the angel here is clearly in a physical form. He strikes Peter and will see other physical things as well. Now this is the only use of the word translated as cell here in the New Testament. It's the word for a dwelling place. And John Phillips said, the Lord's continuing presence in that prison had converted Peter's cell into a home. Peter has quietly made himself at home in prison. If it was the Lord's will for him to be committed to prison, he would be content in prison. Those are the words of John Phillips. And David said, I will both lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, Lord, make me live in safety. That's in Psalm chapter 4, verse 8. And the word translated as live in the psalm is most often translated as dwell. This is the picture of Peter dwelling safely in prison under the protection of the Lord so that he can lie down and sleep, even chained to two guards. Notice neither the appearance of the angel nor the light woke Peter up. We're not told the angel caused the guards to fall into a deep sleep or a trance, but he obviously did something to them. The chains falling off don't wake them either. And the word translated as striking here is patasso, and it's used in a range of intensities from striking Peter here to waking up to Jesus striking down the nations that rebel against him at his second return in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. We see that Peter wasn't just asleep. 
he was in a deep sleep chained to the guards, and notice the detail that he was struck in the side, perhaps in remembrance of Jesus being struck in the side at his death. To get up or arise is one of the most common commands in the Bible, and there are three expressions of urgency in this verse. The angel suddenly appeared. The word translated as get up is in the sense of do it now, and it has the additional word quick added to it. That's the word tacos. We get our word tachometer from it. And notice angels in the Bible always act with a sense of urgency. The word fell in the phrase the chains fell is in the active voice, which means the chains made themselves fall. Now we know that chains can't cause any action by themselves. God or the angel made the chains fall away without waking the guards. And so we see here Agrippa could guard Peter, but he couldn't guard against God. Chris Tomlin's version of Amazing Grace includes the words, My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. That's a picture of what we see here. Verse 8, Get dressed, the angel told him, and put on your sandals. And he did. Wrap your cloak around you, he told him, and follow me. So he went out and followed, and he did not know what the angel did was really happening, but he thought he was seeing a vision. After they passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went outside and passed one street, and suddenly the angel left him. The angel tells Peter to get dressed. God wants us to do the things we can and let him take care of the things we can't do. The language expresses a do-it-now sense of urgency, and Peter obeys right away, all the way. And when the angel said, follow me, Peter had to recall Jesus saying those very words to him in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And we already mentioned this is the second time Peter has been freed from prison by an angel, the other in Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. This time the events seemed to Peter as if walking in a dream. And there will be another setting free of prison involving Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, verses 23 through 34. Now the first set of guards were outside his cell. The second set of guards are not part of the four. They are stationed at the prison gate. And again, nothing is said of what was done to the guards to make it possible to walk right past them. After Passover was completed, Peter was able to pass by the guards. And the prison having an iron gate, again, describes this as a maximum security prison. Now we saw the language suggest the chains fell off on their own. And we're told here the gate opened by itself. The word translated by itself is the word automatos. We get our word automatic from it. This has got to be the first automatic gate in history, right? Well, God obviously opened the gate. The Romans were really advanced, but they hadn't yet created automatic gates. You know what I mean? And this is a great demonstration of what Paul would later write. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's in Romans chapter 8, verse 37. And the angel walks with Peter one block and then leaves. Again, illustrating God wants us to do what we can and let him take care of the things we can't. Brian Bell has a nice summary on this. The angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. I like that. Now let me ask you a question. Is Peter any more alone now than before the angel left? God still has a purpose for Peter. God's presence is with him every bit as much now as when he was in prison and when the angel was with him. We can sort of get the idea that Peter is left alone. He's not alone. God is with him and the Holy Spirit is in him. Verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all the Jewish people expected. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was called Mark, where many had assembled and were praying. We might say Peter came to his senses once the angel departed. Perhaps the angel kept Peter in a dreamlike state to keep him moving quickly and from making any noise. Whatever the condition was, he was now fully alert. Now, several different words can be translated as know in Greek. The one used here means to know by perception. When you add the extra adverb translated as for certain here, we could say Peter knows in his heart that the Lord truly sent his angel. 
So Peter recognized the angel was sent to save him, not just from Herod Agrippa, but from the Jewish religious leaders. And so the Israelites were rescued from bondage at the original Passover, and Peter is rescued from bondage here. Peter has a moment to think and see that he was delivered from bondage. Up to this point, he's moved on command from the angel. Now he moves based on his thoughts. And Peter was very close to John Mark, referring to him as my son in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Now the name Mary means beloved. John means Yah is gracious, Yah being short for Yahweh. And the name Mark can mean hammer or defense. And perhaps in these names, we see God's message to Peter when he was in prison. Beloved, the Lord is gracious and will be your defense. Now, speaking of the people who had assembled and were praying, the word translated as assembled is in the perfect tense and the passive voice. The passive voice means the assembling is done to them. And we've seen this before. They didn't assemble themselves. They were assembled by something outside of them, namely the Holy Spirit. The perfect tense means something that is done once and for all time. It's a picture of God bringing people together for all eternity. It implies continual growth. This really describes God building his church more than people assembling for a prayer meeting. Verse 13, he knocked at the door of the outer gate and a servant named Rhoda came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice and because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the outer gate. Now, this gate is likely one to enter the courtyard to get to the house. The name Rhoda means rose. And the word translated as answer here means to obey. Rhoda was perhaps obedient to her task as a servant in checking the gate. Maybe she was obedient to the Holy Spirit by checking the gate. Now, let me ask you a question. Why didn't the angel open this gate? Well, God leaves for us to do the things we can't do ourselves. We see it again here. And Peter must not have identified himself because she recognizes his voice. And we were told twice the believers were praying in verse 5 and 12. And we're not told what they were praying for specifically, but given that James was recently killed, they were no doubt praying for God to save Peter. Here we see the fulfillment of prayer through the work of an angel. Verse 15, you're out of your mind, they told her, but she kept insisting that it was true, and they said, it's his angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. Now, many in that day and our day believe in the concept of a personal guardian angel assigned to each believer, and this may come from a verse that says, for he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways, that's in Psalms 91, verse 11. And this verse was quoted by Satan to Jesus during his temptation in Matthew chapter 4, verse 6, and Luke chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. And Jesus also said, See to it that you don't despise one of these little ones, because I tell you that in heaven their angels continually view the face of my Father in heaven. That's in Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. The phrase, their angels, seemed to suggest something similar. And recall, Elijah had an army of angels protecting him in 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, they prayed for Peter's release, but assumed the voice that sounded like Peter was far more likely to be his guardian angel who sound like him than it was to be him. This demonstrates a lack of faith that God would do what they prayed for. Let me ask you a question. Why would an angel knock? I don't think an angel ever knocks. They don't have to wait for you to open the gate. We've already seen that. The answer to their prayer was standing outside, but they didn't have enough faith to let him in. They believed in what they were doing, but their expectations were not high. And I wonder how many times I've been guilty of that same thing. Now, for the record, I absolutely believe angels work in people's lives all the time, including my own. The writer of Hebrews describes angels as ministering spirits, sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation. That's in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. And we see it was harder for Peter to get into a prayer service where they were praying for him than out of a Roman maximum security prison. Who says God doesn't have a sense of humor? And as funny as that is, there is a serious message behind it. God does incredible things. He frees people from all kinds of bondage every day. The bondage of sin, substance addiction, 
physical limitations, all kinds of things. Let me ask you a question. As a believer in Jesus, saved from all kinds of bondage, do you find it sometimes difficult to regularly enter fellowship with him in prayer? That's a sobering question. And the word translated as amazed here literally means to be beside oneself. William Mounts says it combines the idea of confusing and astounding with being out of one's senses. Peter standing there makes no sense to them. They couldn't process what their eyes were telling them. The thing they prayed for was fulfilled. They didn't believe it when Rhoda told them Peter was outside, and they couldn't believe it when they saw it. They should have been overjoyed and broke into praise and worship for the fulfilled prayer, but they didn't. Verse 17, motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell these things to James and the brothers, he said, and he left and went to another place. This James is the half-brother of Jesus, the author of the book of James. By this time, James had become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Now, the Bible tells us very little about Peter from this point forward. He's at the Jerusalem conference in Acts chapter 15 in the year 49 or 50, some five or six years later. He suggests he wrote the book of 1 Peter from, quote, Babylon in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Many believe that could be a code word for Rome, but we can't be certain. My study Bible tells me 1 Peter was written in the early 60s. That's roughly 20 years in the future at the close of this passage. 2 Peter was likely written between the years 65 to 68. There's no mention of where Peter was when the book 2 Peter was written. And Peter was martyred in the year 67 or 68, roughly 24 years from this point. Verse 18, At daylight there was a great commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had searched and did not find him, he interrogated the guards and ordered their execution. Then Herod went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. In the original language, there is an emphasis on this great commotion among the guards because this is a matter of life and death. Herod Agrippa's problem is that he searched for Peter when he should have searched for God. And the guards inherit the punishment of the one they lost track of, as we said before. Peter was to be killed, so they are killed. And Herod, going to Caesarea, establishes the setting for the last few verses of this chapter. Okay, well, let's just summarize the rest of the story. Herod Agrippa had a dispute with the people of Tyre and Sidon, who lived further north. We're told that in verse 20. They wanted peace with Agrippa because they depended on food grown in Israel, and they didn't want their food supply cut off. They created an event to make amends where Herod Agrippa is to speak at the theater in Caesarea, which you can visit today. My wife Melba and I have been there. Now the historian Josephus writes about this event, describing Agrippa as wearing a garment with actual silver foil woven into the cloth. His clothes gleamed in the sunshine unlike anything ever seen before. He spoke to them and the crowd shouted, It's the voice of a God and not a man. We're told that in verse 22. Agrippa was a people pleaser for political gain. And the people of Tyre and Sidon were trying to please Agrippa for the same reason. So as the crowd is crying out that this is the voice of a God and not a man, we're then told at once an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. That's in verse 23. And the language of the angel striking him matches the language of the angel striking Peter to wake him. The angel of the Lord rescued Peter from certain death by striking him, and another angel of the Lord strikes Herod, resulting in a gruesome death. One man was living for God's glory, and the other for his own glory. And the picture is we should live enabled by his spirit for God's glory. Self-glorification resulted in an inglorious death. Now, in recording this event, Josephus describes how he died in great pain five days later being eaten by worms. He apparently had some sort of parasitic worm infestation that literally ate him from the inside out. And the final word on all of this is that the word of God spread and multiplied. We're told that in verse 24. And we see in that that God's will will always be done. Okay, well, let's go ahead and summarize here. First, does it take an extreme situation in your life to make you pray? 
Do you metaphorically have to be in prison to encourage you to pray? Do you feel like you're in prison now? Have you gotten so comfortable there that you've fallen into a deep sleep? God wants you to wake up and get up. He wants to take your chains away. I pray that you will pray with fervent prayer that stretches you beyond your comfort. I heard someone say the best way to learn to pray is to pray. The best way to get more comfortable with prayer is to pray. The best way to get more effective at prayer is to pray. Agrippa persecuted Christians to be popular, and the same is true today as then to some degree. It's what we have to live with as Christians. Jesus said to expect it. We live in a world seemingly growing colder to the things of God every day, and in that ebb and flow back and forth, it may feel a little like things are falling back spiritually in our world. God said through Solomon, If my people who bear my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That's in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Prayer is the power of the church and for us. It's been said we don't pray as we should, not because we're too busy, but because we're too confident in our own abilities. God isn't limited by our prayers. He works through our prayers to teach us to depend totally on Him. Second, do you believe God can do what you pray for? Recall David said, we mentioned it earlier in Psalm 5, verse 3, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I plead my case to you and watch expectantly. While we should confidently expect God will respond to things we pray for, he may not grant the things we pray for, but he will respond to our prayers, especially when we pray for things in his will. We saw Peter pray before raising Tabitha, or Dorcas, from the dead, and we may note that Peter was powerful because Peter was prayerful. So too is the church. We see it here. We often hear someone say when faced with something enormous, well, all I can do is pray about it. Prayer is what we should do. Prayer is everything. Recall that the festival of unleavened bread was near and the ritual of removing leaven from your house. It symbolized the removal of sin from a person's life. And in our story today, the sin of unbelief needs to be removed. And maybe it does from your life as it often does from my life. Third, we see Peter is delivered, but James was murdered. And that raises the question of why aren't things fair? God's ways are not our ways. That's from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. We say that often. God is for you and not against you. That's in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. So why didn't God save James? Well, the only difference between James and Peter is time and timing. God viewed the work of James as complete, but not Peter yet. There will be a time when Peter won't get a jailbreak and he will die. Our days are numbered and God is in control. We're told that in Job chapter 14, verse 5. If you're a Christian and believe God promotes you to a place of perfection, well, there really is no untimely death. It's sad for those who are left behind in this world who lose you. And in James' case, it's sad to think that an evil person brought his life to an end. But God's will is ultimately done in all things. Prayer doesn't change God's mind but aligns our hearts and minds with God. God's will was to bring James home to heaven because he had accomplished what God wanted him to. God still had things for Peter to do. And we've said before, some people will glorify God by being saved from suffering and some by being saved through suffering. James was saved through suffering. Peter was saved from suffering for the time being. James was delivered into the presence of God. Peter would eventually be as well, but he had many other trials to go through. Recall Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were threatened with being thrown into the fire if they refused to bow to the golden statue in Babylon. They told the king, if the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue you set up. That's in Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. They knew God could rescue them. Whether he did or not, they would still worship the Lord. And finally, the writer of Hebrews said it's appointed for people to die once 
and then face judgment before God. That's in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And knowing that, how well would you sleep tonight if you knew you were going to die tomorrow? Do you have the kind of peace with the state of your heart and soul that would allow you to sleep comfortably? Do you know that you belong to God for all eternity? You see, instead of sitting in prison, we can walk in his light. And if you don't know that for certain, you can. If you'd like to know more about putting your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, you can reach out to us at the link below. We'd be happy to talk with you about that. And that's a lesson that I have for us from Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 19. And I look forward to our next time together, should the Lord allow.